Liberty family, I'm very excited today. Very excited. Uh, and let me tell you why. Um, I'll, I'll put it to you like this. Uh, I know a lot of good guys in the world. Uh, I know a lot of really cool people. But I know very little men of character. And there's a difference between the two. And I'm excited because today we have a man of character that is going to stand up here and give today's word. He is a friend to me and my wife, along with uh, his beautiful bride and our children play together all the time. They call themselves cousins, it's adorable. Um, he also has top five best man buns I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> But more importantly than anything, and I believe you will experience this for yourself, this is a man that loves God unashamedly and one who I believe, yes, is called to be not only an elder at this church, but also someone that is called to communicate the gospel the way he is doing today. So I would love for you guys to give a rowdy Brooklyn welcome to the one, the only, one of our elders, Peter Fleming. Peter, come on out. Give us today's word, brother. Thanks, Stephen. I didn't know you'd make me get emotional right before I came up. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, hey, church, before um, we get started, um, I also want to take a moment to just honor you, Stephen. Where, where'd you go? Back here. And Jasmine. Um, for the yes that you guys gave to Liberty Church and to our community in Brooklyn. I know our church has been through a lot of transition. It wasn't an easy yes to uproot yourselves from a comfortable life upstate to move to this crazy city and downsize your living arrangements, but we are so grateful you did. Um, and I'll take a leap of faith and speak on behalf of the elders, but we're just so grateful that you guys said yes. We are fully confident that you are the right people for this next chapter in, our, in this church's life. Um, and on a personal note, just as you said, you're my friend, you're my brother, um, and you have already inspired me and pushed me in my faith so much. And I think, you know, church, as you, if you're new or um, haven't had the chance to get to know these guys, I think the thing I would say is they're the real deal. You guys are the real deal. They have a faith that is not just here on Sunday morning to put on a faith and uh, put on a face and say yes, I'm your pastor. But they have a faith that they live out through the week, and that's really what inspires me. So thank you for that. Yes, can we give it up for them? All right. Well, I'm excited to continue in the series that we've been in over the last few weeks called Defining Moments, how meeting Jesus leads to radical life change. And if you've been with us for the last few weeks, we've been exploring stories throughout the Bible of how certain individuals meet and encounter Jesus and how that really opens them up to tra true transformation and life change. And we're exploring how those same transformations and changes can impact us 2,000 years later. So today we'll be exploring a story of about of two sisters, Mary and Martha, and those surrounding them in community, um, and how when they encounter Jesus, they're given hope. They're given true, lasting hope. And my prayer for us today is that we encounter that same hope, that we just not, not just be inspired by a great story um, a great message, but that we're actually empowered to live and breathe lasting hope in our present reality. So let's pray before we jump in. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that your presence is already here. We thank you for this time of worship that we've had just to shift our focus to you and honor and glorify you. And Lord, we pray that you continue to do that through this next half hour or so, Lord, will you speak through my words? Will you speak to each of us individually? Lord, you have something for each of us here today. And I pray that you empower us to step bolder into the hope that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I think we use the word hope pretty casually, pretty often, right? I probably use the word hope, I don't know, a hundred times in the last week. I Tell my wife, I 
really hope uh, Serena doesn't wake up before 6 a.m. again. Um, I say, I really, really hope that my seamless order doesn't come cold. Um, I really hope that the Tottenham Hotspur, my soccer team, make it finish in the top four of the Premier League. Amen? Anyone? Yes? We got one? Perfect. We're, we're praying for a miracle there. I hope my back pain doesn't stop getting worse. I hope, I hope, I hope. We use it often, and it's often based on wishful thinking. It can be often based on some sort of prediction or a bet that we want to make where we say, I really want this thing to happen, but I'm also embracing the reality that it may not happen um, and that that bet may not pay off. But today what we'll explore is that the hope that we find in Jesus is not a hope-so hope. It's not a wishful hope. It's not a I've got good chances hope. The hope we find in Jesus is a complete resting in his goodness, a full assurance of the future that we do have in him, but also a certainty that he is for me and with me now. I like to think of myself as a futurist, speaking of the future. I love to think about the future, dream about the future, plan for the future. So the word hope to me comes naturally in the language that I use. And beyond my words, I kind of consider being a futurist a part of my DNA. You know those personality tests? Anyone here like the Enneagram? Yes. I always have to ask my wife what, what number I am. I always forget. You've got Myers-Briggs. You've got Strengths Finder. You've got what Harry Potter house are you? You've got what's your original Pokemon, best for your personality. All these things I can't keep up. I can't keep track. But one that has always stood out to me was that Strengths Finder one. And one of the top kind of characteristics that it told me about my personality was that I am a futurist. I'm fascinated by and can become fixated on the future, as my wife Abby can attest. I can mold a picture of the future in my head and let it really inspire and drive me today. To me, it becomes a little more naturally to sacrifice the now for the sake of the future. And that can be a good thing, a great thing, in some cases, but it can also cause me to miss out on things that are right in front of me in the now and in enjoying the moments that I'm living in right now. Just a quick story to illustrate that. Speaking of Pokemon, third grade, or really I think it started in about first grade, the best TV series of all time, Pokemon, was turning into a movie or becoming a movie series. Okay, not only do we now get 30, what we love for 30 minutes or 22 minutes, whatever it was on TV, but now we get a full feature-length film. And in third grade, Pokemon, uh, let's see, what are they called? The third movie, I, get, I forget exactly the title, but the third Pokemon movie came out. I was ecstatic as a third grader. I got it from my parents on not just my streaming account on Netflix, not just a DVD. I got it on a VHS, thick <laughs> tape thing weighed probably three pounds, and I was so excited. I was so excited, actually, that I really, really wanted the, the watching experience to be perfect. I was fixated on having the perfect environment. Again, I'm in third grade, but I wanted the best TV in the house. I wanted no distractions. I wanted the best snacks that we have. I was so focused on enjoying that movie for the first time as best I could that I went weeks without watching it. It just sat on my shelf. Nope, nope, this is not the moment. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Dad, for getting me this, but I'm, I'm still waiting. And actually, I had a friend. Uh, his name was Matt. He came over, and he saw it on the shelf. And he said, oh, my gosh, you got the movie. Yeah, man, I got the movie. I got that movie. All right, let's watch it. Let's watch it. Well, uh, I don't know. I'm, I, it doesn't feel right right now. And he insisted, he insisted, so he took that movie, he went down to my basement, and he watched that movie by himself. <laughs> Without me, I refused to watch the movie. And I think shortly thereafter, I started thinking about how crazy that was and looking at it now. I was so fixated on having the perfect moment to embrace and experience Pokemon 3 that I missed out on an opportunity 
to be with my friend, to experience it with him, and to have a bonding moment with him. And as we turn to our text today, I think we see a similar character who's looking forward to the future, and Jesus reorients the future with the now. And we come to an incredibly tense, real-life moment that's playing out and explore how these characters focus on the future as a source of hope, but Jesus gently, lovingly corrects them and steers them towards a fuller picture of hope and a hope that can be applied here and now. So before, we'll have the um, text on the screen if you don't, didn't bring your Bible um, as well. But before we jump into it, just the setting of this story. So this is John 11. The story is in the town of Bethany, which is just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And we'll, we'll explore a little bit more of why that's significant later. Um, Jesus has a really close relationships with three siblings, Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. They're in Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem, and Jesus and the disciples are um, a, few mile, or a few towns away, and they've been asked to come uh, be with them in this time where Lazarus has become really ill. So let's turn to the text. John 11, starting in verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So our story actually starts, and Lazarus has passed. Jesus was warned, or asked to come, uh, about four days earlier. He was told that Lazarus was sick, but by the time he comes, Lazarus is already dead. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, were the ones who sent for them. And they sent for him because they were at a point of desperation. Lazarus was sick at the brink of death, and they wanted Jesus to come into that dire situation. Can you imagine being Martha and Mary in those few days, those four days that it took for Jesus to come from where he was to here? And by the way, Jesus actually waited where he was for two days purposefully. He didn't come immediately when Mary and Martha sent for him. Can you imagine being Mary and Martha saying, where are you, Jesus? Why are you not here? We know what you're capable of. We know that your source of your miracle power is from our Heavenly Father, but yet you are not here. And the text actually says many of the Jews had already gotten there to console them. Everyone was there grieving alongside Mary and Martha, except for Jesus. Sometimes, maybe often, Jesus' response to our asks, our prayers, don't fit into exactly what we expect it to be. So we'll continue in the text with John 11 in verse 21. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jumping to 32, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary and Martha have the same response. Lord, if only you had been here. Their responses are, peop- are, are from people who are intimately close to Jesus. And I think the words are short, but the message is really deep of what they're communicating, if you had been there. They both affirm the the miracle working power that Jesus has. They recognize that, yes, Jesus, you are the one, the greatest healer, and you could have done this. But yet, they kind of put the blame on Jesus for not doing enough. They know what he was capable of, and that's why they called him. Do you ever find yourself blaming God as well for the pain that you're experiencing? Have you gone through moments of life where your hope has wavered, 
where your faith has fallen short, where you've been challenged and you've had moments of crying out, if only you had been here. God, why were you not there? I needed you. We have moments of feeling abandoned, moments of feeling alone, and we will be caught up in the things of this world and miss the things of Jesus, as honest as we may be in those moments. And the truth that I think we need to wrestle with here is that knowing Jesus intimately does not mean we will have a life without pain or disappointment. Mary and Martha were about as close and intimate with Jesus as you could possibly be, but yet they still are experiencing pain. And that brings us to the first of hopefully three simple points today, which is that Jesus meets us in our pain and brings hope to our sadness. Jesus meets us in our pain and brings hope to our sadness. Again, a life with Jesus does not mean we won't have pain. What it does mean is we'll have a comforter in our midst. Amen? Jesus doesn't scold Mary and Martha for their doubt in his plan or discredit their belief or discredit their pain. He meets them in that grief. He empathizes with them. And as we're about to see, he cries with them. I think the amazing thing here is that Jesus' reaction, again, doesn't discredit the pain that you or I experience in life. It actually validates it. It actually validates that the sorrow, the grief, the tears that we have in life are an inevitable reality. Jesus is not saying that you need to push those things away, that a life with him is a life of just smiles, butterflies, and rainbows. And it doesn't mean that we lack faith if we feel those things. Your sorrow, your pain, your feelings of loneliness, your questioning of God's involvement in your life, don't scare Jesus away. And when we experience those things, Jesus meets us in the pain. Looking at verse 32. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? Speaking of Lazarus. They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit in this moment. He steps into the pain of Mary and Martha and embraces it and empathizes with it. He's full of sorrow for his friend, Lazarus. And I feel like you could write a whole sermon about those two words. Jesus wept, right? It's kind of a famous verse. Everyone knows it's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. Two words, but yet there is so much to be said there. Just briefly, I think it's not just Jesus empathizing with Mary and Martha, although that's a big piece of it. I think Jesus is actually starting to internalize and come face to face with the reality of the enemy of death that he is about to face too. Lazarus' death, in many ways, and that's why we're talking about it on Palm Sunday before Easter, is a preview of his own. And what he's about to do with with Lazarus is a preview of his story too. And I think Jesus is not just empathizing with the sadness and the grief, but he actually is overwhelmed by the narrative that is about to be played out in his own life and the preview of that narrative that is in this moment, in this story. And I think Jesus is in awe of the splendor and glory, and the power of his Father, and moved to tears because of it. How amazing is it that the Jesus who meets us in our pain is also the Jesus who is confident and in awe of God's story being played out. Now I want to look at one other response, Uh, this one from Martha. As I think there's something here that Jesus is teaching Martha 
and by extension us, about hope and about a life with Jesus. Because Martha actually displays a great hope and a great faith in many ways. She actually, what we're about, we're about to read, exemplifies what we should say. She's de- she declares king, Jesus is king, but yet Jesus is about to open the floodgates to Martha about what true hope is. So let's turn to verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha, do you believe this? Martha's reaction to Jesus saying, your brother will be raised from the dead, is that she says, yes, Lord, I get it. He will be raised in the great resurrection on the last day. Her response is in line with the teaching of the day, the Jewish thought and and teaching of of what will come in the future. And her response is actually in line with Jesus' own teaching. In many ways, this is the right Christian Sunday school answer. You know those kids that whenever you ask a question in Sunday school, whatever it is, they just say, Jesus. Like, well, yeah, I guess you're not right. I mean, you're not wrong. Mary has the right response, and it is a response with faith. It is a response with an understanding of our future victory and life with God. In many ways, we as Christians would do well to exemplify what Martha's response, and that would be what we would hope to respond in that moment of of true grief and agony. C.S. Lewis says it this way. This is from Mere Christianity. A continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. In many ways, Martha's response is the right response, but yet... As we look at Jesus' response to her, Jesus doesn't pat her on the back for the correct answer. He sees her faith. He sees her hope. But he redefines the hope that she has and empowers her in a way to embrace it now. So how does Jesus respond? Jesus doesn't say, yes, you're right. There will be a great resurrection. It will be amazing. And I'm the one that will do that. We are all awesome. No. He says... I am the resurrection. He says to Martha, I am the life. What is he saying here? He's saying that the power to take something fully dead and make it fully alive is within him. The power over death is embodied in the person and the being of Jesus. And actually, I want to pause on the I am part of this text too. I am is actually a claim of deity. In the book of Exodus, Moses has this amazing and rare encounter with the presence and power of God in the story of the burning bush. And in that story, Moses asks God, what should he call God when he goes back to the Israelites to tell them what had just happened? And let's turn to Exodus 3, verse 14. God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus is taking on the name of God in this passage. He's saying, I am the resurrection. I am the life. The ever-present 
nature of God, the power of life over death itself is embodied in Jesus. I think as we think about um, comments like this, oftentimes today people will look to Jesus as a great moral teacher in history, right? Those that don't profess the Christian faith say, can totally get that Jesus lived and walked and breathed on the earth and he had some great things to say and he guides us in a morality-based life to do good and to love those around us. But I think here's where that falls short. I think when you actually look at the words of Jesus, there's only two options. Either he's right and he is God, or he's absolutely crazy, okay? The middle ground of a great moral teacher, sure, he maybe had some good things to say that can be applied nice and put on posters, but Jesus was not just a great moral teacher. Either you accept him for who he is, or you say he is crazy and he thinks he's God and he's not. Again, Jesus taking on the name of God in this case. But what he's saying to Martha which is so powerful, is that that power, that divine identity, is accessible to Martha and therefore to us through relationship. He has this encounter with Martha on a one-on-one setting, but I believe it's a truth for all of us. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. You too will go through death. But for those that believe the resurrection Life that Jesus breathes back into us will never die again. Amen? Amen. In a one-on-one intimate discussion, Jesus tells Martha that the thing she is hoping for is standing right in front of her. Now I want to explore really what I think is a key principle from this interaction of how God is operating in the world today. The kingdom of God sits in this tension of the present and the future. It is both in the future and something we can hope for, but present now. And maybe it seems like an oxymoron, but that principle is that God's kingdom is already and not yet. God's kingdom is already here and not yet here. See, before Jesus walked this earth, The people that were prophesying his coming, that were prophesying um, victory, thought of how that would come as a grand military political victory. They expected that the current age that they lived in would end the same time the new world, the new age, would begin. But what Jesus actually says is that The current age is ending, but yet the new age still is yet to come. And we live in that tension where even though the new age has begun, it is not yet fully here. And we think about our hope. We live in that in-between. So the second point of three for today is that our hope is the confidence that God's kingdom is already and not yet. Our hope is the confidence that God's kingdom is already and not yet. Again, Mary was, Martha, excuse me, was fixated on the future, not yet, and missing out on the already. And God's lesson to Martha and Mary is that the kingdom is coming now. His resurrection is the future, but Jesus' life is the resurrection now. I think we personally, in our lives, in Brooklyn and wherever we're joining online, we live in that tension as well. And I think we can fall into the same boat as Martha of stressing one over the other. If we overemphasize the already and focus too much on God is here now, his presence is here, his power is here, thank you, Lord, the kingdom has come. If we overemphasize that aspect, then I think we miss the reality that there are powers of evil at work in this world. 
We see them every day on the news, on our walks, in our stories that we hear from friends and family. And if we ignore that, we'll be blind to those realities. And I think we'll offer up quick solutions to really complex problems. If we focus too much on the God's kingdom is here and we have full access to it, our quick solutions will fade. We might become jaded and doubtful when those quick solutions don't work out and maybe doubt that God was ever here and ever working to begin with. But what the not yet gives us is that the perspective that while God's kingdom is already here, there's still an appropriate yearning for his coming and what's coming next. What if we overemphasize the not yet? Overemphasize that Jesus will come just like Martha. We believe it. We know it will come. We'll miss out on the power and the presence of God here with us now and a power that is available to us today. If we focus on the not yet, we might withdraw from the world, not embrace God's invitation to step in to his creation and coming kingdom. He already gives us that perspective that while God's kingdom is, yes, not yet, God is active and moving, and he has created a place for you and for me to partner with him in that coming. Tim Keller released a book about a year ago called Hope in Times of Fear. And actually, he released this in the midst of not only just the COVID pandemic, um, but also in the midst of his own um, uh, battle with cancer. Tim Keller, if you, if you haven't heard of him, is an incredible pastor in the city. And he says this in the book, The kingdom of God is already here, but not yet in its fullness. We must not underestimate how present the kingdom of God is, but we must not under, underestimate how unrealized it is, how much it exists only in the future, Because the kingdom is present partially, but not fully, we must expect substantial healing, but not total healing in all areas of life. I think that can be hard because we want that total healing, right? But yet there is substantial healing that is available now. As we come back to the text The story could have stopped here, right? John 11 could have stopped here. Jesus could have moved on. And the story would have still been a great one. There still would have been so many things that we could capture and learn from this story. But the story goes on. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord... By this time, there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Again, the story could have ended before this resurrection. We would have encountered how Jesus meets us in our pain, comforts us through our sadness, provides hope through our sadness, We would have seen how Jesus speaks to the present reality of his life and resurrection and taken a lot away to chew on. But yet, Jesus acts. Jesus doesn't just say these words, that he is the resurrection. He proves it. This story is Jesus showcasing that the words he's saying aren't just words, but that God's kingdom that he has been professing over and over again is starting to take shape now. Jesus proves that his power to bring the future hope of renewal and life has immediate impact. 
And that's our last point for today. Our hope looks to the future, and it comes from the future with immediate impact. Our hope looks to the future and comes from the future with immediate impact. Now, as we close out this passage, I think what's interesting that John does in this passage is that at the climax of the story, when Lazarus actually is raised from the dead, which we can just read it and go past it, but how incredible and amazing is that when you actually pause to think about it? But can you imagine what Lazarus' response would be? What Mary and Martha, who we've just been on this grand journey with, would be, but yet the text doesn't give us their reaction. I think we readers from the 21st century, we have these endless grand movies and these stories, and we want to see all these things pay off. But yet what John does is he doesn't focus on those things. Why? Because the focus here is on Jesus. John is focusing our attention in this text on the ultimate messianic sign that points to Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. Thinking about today, like I said earlier, today is Palm Sunday, one week before Easter Sunday. This is the start of the last chapter of the Lent season and the Easter season that we've been in. Why is this story so important in context of today being Palm Sunday? Earlier in John, there are these stories and stories of Jesus' uh, miracles, his working power, uh, professing his kingdom come, God's kingdom's coming. And we read that the Jewish leaders over the course of this time are getting increasingly frustrated at the growing popularity of Jesus but they're also growing in anger at the words that he's saying. The story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead becomes the final straw for the Jewish leaders. This story is actually kicking off the process to arrest and try him for blasphemy. And Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that the story that was playing out in that moment, the story of Jesus raising a man from the dead, was about to kick off his own story. Bethany is two miles from Jerusalem, the home of where these angry Jewish leaders are. Jesus and even the disciples, they knew that when they went to Lazarus, that they would not only be close to danger, close to risk of just being there. But yet they did an act, and Jesus did an act that was so much greater than what has come before that it was the catalyst for what comes next. And then on Palm Sunday, shortly thereafter, as if he's not close enough to the danger, Jesus enters Jerusalem. He knows that there are two large cohorts of people that are in Jerusalem. Those that have chosen Jesus and said, yes, I believe in him and I have faith in him and I'm going to follow him. And the second cohort of people that are angry at Jesus and those people being quite powerful. Jesus knows that when he walks into Jerusalem, he's gonna be welcomed by the people that profess him as God, as the coming Messiah. But he's also gonna be met by those that are already plotting to arrest and kill him. The story of Lazarus is a preview of Jesus' own story. But amazingly, death is not the ultimate destination for Lazarus. The story of Lazarus is one that goes through death. And for Jesus, death is also not the ultimate destination. He too is brought through death. And we get to participate in this grand arc of Jesus' story and life. 
and apply that to ours as well. Romans 6, verses 4 to 5, says, we were, buried th- we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Well, we'll have to come back next week for Easter Sunday and see what unfolds as Jesus enters Jerusalem. We'll see what the next chapter is that leads to Jesus' physical, bodily death and also resurrection. And that's so key to this story because without the Easter resurrection, the hope that Jesus speaks of fades into a hope-so hope. It fades into a wishful hope. But with the resurrection, a true hope is anchored in Jesus conquering death and opening up a life that's connected to him. If Jesus really did die and and was raised again and came out of that grave, everything will be all right. If Jesus really rose from the dead, walked out of that grave, his claim that this world will be cleansed of sin and pain and death is only a matter of time. Everything will be renewed. If Jesus really rose from the dead, this renewal has already begun. Now, I won't go into too much of the story for next week, but as we think about the resurrection, just a couple quick thoughts. I don't know where each of you are in terms of how your emotional reaction is to that story. Obviously, it's a commonly told story, and even those that don't profess Christianity know the basic building blocks of the story. But what I'll say is this. If the resurrection is true, if Jesus really came and really rose from the dead, then I think what we've seen in this story is that the significance of that cannot be described. If you are at the point of, I can't believe that story yet, I hope you can at least see, if it is true, how significant it is. And I think and I hope that if you see how significant it is, then you would think it's worth exploring if it really happens. If it really is true, then it is worth exploring if it really happens, because the significance is life-changing. I want to end with a quote of how we can embrace an eternal hope today. This last quote is by Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's a British minister at the turn of the 20th century. And he says it this way. He says it beautifully. Because we are with Christ, we are already enjoying something of the life of heaven even now. The Apostle Paul talks about partaking of the first fruits. He talks about having a foretaste. The great harvest has not yet come, but the first, fru- first fruits are available now, the glimpses of glory. We should have the occasional glimpse. We should occasionally have heard something of the music. We should have some sensation of the life that will be lived there. Church, an encounter with God's kingdom and the presence of Jesus here and now is coming face to face with a life-changing beauty, a life-changing glory, a life-changing hope. The greatest feast is yet to come, but those first fruits are available now. God's unending glory is yet to come, but we can catch glimpses of his splendor now. The masterpiece is yet to be performed, but previews are available now. How? Jesus. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Let's pray. 
Father God, we thank you for the life that you live. We thank you for the life that you give us through you. We thank you that in this story you show us how you give us hope in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our sorrow. And I thank you that you show us how we can found our hope, or we can find our hope in not just the future victory that we have in you, but in the present reality of your presence with us. Lord, I pray that you would empower each of us to step into that, to live in that day after day, embracing what you have for us now, but yet looking forward to the great feast that we have to come. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you came through death for us, Lord, and that we can find life and life abundant in you. In Jesus' name, amen.